from the heart of Calgary's Red Mile. You're listening to the Friday Night Lights Podcast with Jay Kirsch. Human beings in a mind. What's a mind to a king? What's a king to a god? What's a god to a non-believer who don't believe in? to welcome you to yet another episode and uh yeah we're pumping these babies out man so i'm really happy that we're back on track and actually i shouldn't say back on track you got to be on track to get back on it so i'll just say we are on track right now and uh busting out these podcasts every week now i've got a bit of a library i've got some interviews that have been saved up and uh, you know of course some i post um on the regular, and I know it's been a little up and down, but uh, I'm not going to waste all this time with another apology. I've already apologized enough. So, um, yeah, I'm going to start posting these things every Sunday so that you can have them for the work week. That's how much I think about you, is that while you're in your cubicle or on the road or at the gym or wherever you are laying in bed and you are got your little headphones plugged in and you're listening to me, talk to you I uh, I'm doing this for you this isn't for me this is all for you okay I'm out here sacrificing I'm out here you know sweating blood and tears so that you guys can all have something to listen to while you're while you're working so <laughs> of course I'm joking uh, no but seriously um, so yeah so I the way that the podcast usually goes is that I record an intro and before the show and the intro is just kind of an opportunity for me to, to say hi and, and, you know, talk to you guys a bit before I talk to my guest. Um, so I, I want to first off start by saying that when this post, it's going to be my older brother, Jason's birthday. So I want to do, uh, and, and you guys know Jason from the round table podcast. Um, he sat in on, on quite a few shows with me and, uh, He's he's the Andy Rooney of of, of the podcast, uh, the old curmudgeon, the guy who was like pissed off at uh, at uh, what's that band from Russia, the chicks, the uh, pussy pussy uh, kill pussy or I don't know what the hell they're called anyway. Remember he was that was the episode where he got mad because they were at McDonald's the. Uh, <laughs> that's my brother man he gets mad if they're not bunk enough that's uh he'll find stuff to get pissed off about man so anyway i just wanted to uh, tell my older brother uh very happy birthday uh he's 18 today and no i'm joking uh no he's uh he's uh he's older than me and uh he uh he's man yeah he's like my best friend man uh we're closer in age than my two younger brothers so we kind of grew up you know, the two younger ones grew up together, and myself and Jason kind of grew up more closer together. Um, but, I mean, shit, man, I miss all my brothers. I got three brothers. They're all up in Calgary. and uh, But my older brother and I, um, you know, we've always been close just because of the age thing. And uh, I just wanted to uh, to wish you a happy birthday, man, and, and thank you for all your graciousness and, and, uh, and love and, and the example you set for everybody, um, gen- generosity and, and all that stuff. So... We love you, man. Sending you a big old Texas. How do you do? Anyway. Anyway, I hope everyone's having a good week. Um, yeah, so back to my format for the podcast. I was I was going to tell you guys that uh, before I got sidetracked there. Um, yeah, usually I record an intro just to, you know, kind of check in with you guys. And, and it's like my weekly therapy session. I get to check in with you and... and you know, it's a little cathartic for me. I can tell you my problems and the shit I'm going through. And, uh, you know, hope that you guys relate in some, you know, sadistic way. That uh, my problems align with your problems somehow. Um, so, yeah. So, anyway, I had recorded uh, an interview. And, I, like I said, I do an intro afterwards. Which I did. I did a, a really killer intro uh, for this podcast. And... I played it back. I have kind of a test audience, um, which usually I send it to my mom, 
and I'll send it to uh, maybe, you know, my daughter will listen to it. It kind of, you know, depending on if, whether it's appropriate or not for her to listen to. But I, my mom is, you know, kind of the gauge, right? And, and, and she kind of tells me, you know, whether it's something that, that grabs her attention or if it hooks her in or whatever. And, uh, yeah, it got pretty, got pretty fucking deep, man. Like deep, like, you know, actually, I think I cried at the end of it. Um, yeah, you know what? It, 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 it got into a lot of, uh, I kind of went off on a bit of a tangent about the recent shootings that had happened and, and, uh, that, that one down in Isla Vista in Santa Barbara. And I also talked about, um, the, the young students that were killed in Calgary and, uh, just talked to just, you know, about the healing process. And, and I also talked about my, my friend Wyatt and, and, uh, you know, his trial that's going on, uh, you know, he was a victim, uh, as well, uh, of a, uh, of, of a murder and, uh, just, yeah, I really started getting into it, man. And, and, and just started talking about the healing process and, and how people can come together and how you can help each other. And yeah, man, it got pretty, pretty fucking deep. And, uh, like, you know, we're talking boner breaker material and, uh, I got pretty, I got pretty emotional, but I mean, I, I really put my, my heart and soul into it and it, and it was a really good intro, but I just kind of felt that it was maybe a bit heavy for it. And, and I certainly don't want to overshadow my interview with a ultra heavy intro. Um, and, and so I'm going to tell you now that I, I, I will release that intro at some point in the future. It, it, it might just be, um, a solo thing. It might just be, you know, cause I, I think it's unfair to, to kind of overshadow, an interview that you do with somebody with something that emotional, you know, it, it kind of puts you in a different headspace. And then for that to flow into an interview with somebody that, that, you know, then the, the interview, the, the, the energy of the interview was, was a very different energy from what my intro was. So, uh, my interview, you know, it was, was, you know, it was insightful and it was deep and it was, it was also really funny. I had, you know, a lot of good laughs and, and, um, and, and so, yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to put that on my interview. I, I wanted to, uh, I want to wait. And, and that's, it's just something that, uh, you know, I probably, you know, want to share with you at some point. I, I just don't want to do it on this episode. So we're, we're going to, we're going to put that in the can is what they say in the business, even though I've never really been in the business. Um, yeah, we're going to put that in the can for another time and, and you guys can, uh, you guys can just stick with this intro here the second rate intro because honestly that last one I would have had you guys crying I mean seriously like you guys would have been bawling um so yeah so anyway I hope everyone's having a good week I uh I had a really interesting week actually um just doing a lot of thinking about stuff and and uh, I was actually able to go and connect with a, a friend of mine um, this weekend, uh, for a couple of beers and, and it had been a long time since I had seen her and, and it, it was really great, man. It, it was so great to see her happy and, and, you know, things are going so well for her. And, uh, and, you know, we, this is, this is somebody that I knew since high school. And when we had reconnected a, a couple of years ago, uh, when I, when I came back to Houston and, uh, yeah, man, it, it was, it was so cool because, uh, when, when we originally reconnected, um, you know, we, I was, had, you know, gone through a, a pretty bad breakup. She had gone through a really messy, uh, breakup and, and, uh, and I, I don't know, man, we just, we kind of connected on that sad level. <laughs> we kind of rekindled our friendship on that, on, uh, on that sad level, but, but we reconnected. It, it, it was just, it was great. It was like, we picked up right where we we left off. Actually, I shouldn't say that because we, I left on a very bad note with her back in high school. Um, I, I, this, this friend of mine, she, uh, I had the biggest crush on her in high school and, uh, she was this, uh, nowadays they'd probably call her emo, but back then it was new wave, right? Like when I was young, my brother and you know, all of us were in high school, uh, and I'm talking like freshman year, like high school, not, not like when I was a senior or something like that. But when we were in high school, 
Oh man, I was in the ninth grade, so we would have been freshmen, and my friend was, she was in the same grade as me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we were in the same grade. So anyway, I was in love with her, and uh, like, head over heels, I thought she was the cutest thing, and, and you know, you, you know high school crushes, right? You know, you think high school is going to be forever. So anyway, I threw myself at the on the mercy of the court and, and, and basically professed my love to her and said that I thought she was, you know, the hottest thing since, uh, you know, at that time, um, probably Susie and the Banshees or something or, or 10,000 Maniacs or I don't know who I compared her to, but I was just like, hey, I think you're the, you know, you, uh, you put the bunny men in the echo. So, uh, yeah, we were all big New Wave Cure fans and, and New Order and all that shit. But anyway, she was just somebody that was always hanging around with us. And, and she was just, you know, a really good friend. And and, uh, and so anyway, I, I told her how I felt about her. And I asked her to the school dance. And it was our freshman homecoming dance. And uh, she said, yeah. And I, I'm... I'm pretty sure it was done out of pity back then because she I mean she she wasn't into me I mean she, we were just friends I mean she it was clear she didn't like me the way that I liked her right and so I think she just was you know being nice about it or whatever and um she we went together to this dance and and uh and I don't even I don't even think I tried making a move on her maybe I tried holding her hand or I don't know something but but uh Needless to say, I wasn't a smooth operator like I am now. You know, I, I wasn't the the Casanova that that uh, that I am now. So anyway, I, I think uh, you know by the end of the night, it, it was quite clear anyway that that she wasn't into me as much as I was into her, and we kind of went our separate ways. And uh, I think it was like a, a couple of weeks had gone by, and my mom had broke the news that we were moving to Canada, and uh, I had met up with her and I said uh, I said you know what I, I'm i going to be leaving in like a month or something like that or a couple of months or something like that and I really want to be your boyfriend until I leave that was probably my way of kind of like you know tricking her or sucking her into to a relationship with me um, I was pretty conniving back then even uh, as well but uh, anyway she said no I don't want a boyfriend I, I just she probably gave me the I'm working on myself line, even back then, back in the 80s. Um, she was way ahead of our time. Anyway, she, she just said no. She didn't want a boyfriend. She wasn't interested in relationships, or I don't know what the excuse was. But it was something to that effect, that she didn't want a boyfriend. And so I was like, okay, you know, fair enough. And then like two days later, <laughs> two days later, I see her walking down the hallway, and she's holding hands with this other guy. And it broke my heart. Like... Uh, just, yeah. Have you ever had like a crush on somebody and, or, you know, you, you really liked a girl and then they told you that they just, you know, that they didn't want to be with anybody at, you know, but they just didn't have, you know, the heart to, to, to break yours. And, you know, they think they're doing you a favor because it's like, oh, well, I don't want to see this guy suffer. But at the same time, like I can't pretend forever and not be with someone I really like. So anyway, I think she was just trying to uh, to spare me the hurt. And uh, anyway, I saw her holding hands with this guy. And she didn't see me, but I saw them walking. And he was this other kid, a skater, you know, kind of a kid that just looked at the ground all the time and, you know, had the bangs and the, you know, flannel shirt and the, you know, skateboarded. And, you know, he asked him what's wrong, and he was just like, no, nah, don't worry, I'll figure it out. You know, they, that type of a you know, troubled emo kid, the one that always attracts chicks. Yeah. So anyway, that was my competition back then. And, and I couldn't measure, I mean, you know, it's like saying that you wanted to go up against Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam. I mean, chicks love the depressed, despondent, troubled youth look. And, and I just wasn't that. I was like squeezed into skinny jeans and probably had some eyeliner on or something like that. And, and, uh, you know, maybe a safety pin through my ear just to kind of round out the look. But, I was just always too happy to be in that scene, man. I wasn't depressed. I wasn't unhappy about anything. I was I was a pretty happy kid. So anyway, my last day of school, I uh 
the, well, the last day that I was going there, I was moving to Canada, and uh, the last day I was there, I, I went into the gym, and I was just going around saying goodbye to all my friends, and, and you know, one of those, you just go around and you try to just see as many people as you can and break the news that you're moving to Canada, and then, you know, you got the big goodbye, even from people you don't really know. So anyway, I walk in the gym, and I see her and him sitting on the bleachers in the in in the gym, and uh, I was with a buddy of mine, and he goes, hey, we got to cut to the other side of the gym, so let's go under the bleachers, like, we'll walk, you know, we'll go to the other side of the gym, instead of walking on the basketball court, we'll walk underneath the bleachers and get to the other side, so I was like, okay, sure, man, and so we walk underneath, and just as I'm walking by, underneath her, she yells down, hey, Jake, and I stop, and I look up, and I see them both looking down at me, and she's like, what are you doing, and I said, oh, I'm just getting ready to go to Canada, and she's like, oh, my God, are you leaving, like, tomorrow? And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, this is my last day of school. And she looks down, and she's like, I'm going to miss you. And they're holding hands, and he's smiling down at me as well. And what does Jake Hirsch do? That's right. I pulled out the old double barrels, man, both fingers, put them up to her, and I said, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Straight up, man. I just let it rip. It was like all, you know, and, and I, I will probably never have another dramatic exit like that again in my life. But that was the most dramatic exit I've ever had in my life. Just two big birds and go fuck yourself. And the look on her face, if I could have, <laughs> if there was uh, uh, a phone with a camera on it back then, I would have snapped a picture because it was priceless. She just looked at me like, oh my God, I can't believe you just did that. But anyway, that was the last time I saw her for probably 20 years. I never talked to her again. That was it. She broke my heart and I think his name was Scotty or I don't know what his name was. I don't know. Some, I, I don't even remember the kid's name that she was with, but uh, anyway, they broke my heart. Uh, I broke off the finger to both of them, and Jake Hirsch made his way to Canada and to all of your lives, and that was it. So anyway, fast forward 20 years, and uh, she is a, a very successful businesswoman and, and a great mom and uh, and just an amazing friend. And and we reconnected, and, and it was so great to see her, man, and... and uh, so anyway, over the past couple of years, we've gotten really close. And like I said, when we had reconnected, it was both kind of at the tail end of some bad relationships. And um, yeah, we just were really there for each other as friends. And, and we just rekindled this great friendship. And uh, and and it was just amazing. And, and we've been friends, solid friends ever since. So uh, yeah, no more giving, giving my friend the finger, uh, you know, when she... You know, when she gets me upset, I've 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 learned some other coping skills in the last 20 years that I'm pull out of the bag if uh, if I get in a fight with my friends. But uh, anyway, we met up for a beer today, and I hadn't seen her since I was in Canada, and she's doing amazing. She's you know great boyfriend, and and the kids are great, and I mean everybody's happy, and it was so great. It was like the circle of life, you know. It was just everything kind of came around and, and, uh, you know, we, we talk about that, that grand exit that I made 20 years ago, you know, from time to time. And, and we just laugh, man. It was just, it was just epic. And it's probably even more, I mean, what, I'm 39 now. So she's, uh, that, that was freshman year. I was probably what, 14, 13, yeah, 13, probably 13 years old. Yeah, man. That's a long time. That's a hell of a long time ago. It was like 26 years ago, 25 years ago. Anyway, yeah. So it's cool. You know, some people that you're friends with back then, you don't never think you're going to be friends with again in 25 years or, or whatever. And I'm, I'm glad to say that I'm, I'm still friends with uh, with with some of those people. And, and she's definitely a big, big, big part of it. And, and I'm just really happy that uh, that we were able to reconnect again and, and, uh, and hang out. And she's become a really good friend. So anyway, uh I don't know whatever happened to the guy, though. I hope he got hit by a butt. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. No. Seriously, though. Um, anyway, so my interview today that you guys are going to be listening to um, for the podcast is a guy by the name of Mark Pavlich. And when I say the name Mark Pavlich, 
I'm sure there's a million words that come to mind. And I've heard them all. Trust me. I've been around uh, the mixed martial art game for a long time. Now, a lot of people will look at this and or listen to this and be like, oh, it's, a, you know, MMA and mixed martial art. It's not. When I did this podcast, it was never to talk about mixed martial arts. You know, I've, I've had an ass full of mixed martial, mixed martial arts my entire life. I've managed fighters. I've, you know... <sighs> Yeah, I've been around the block and back with mixed martial arts, and 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 I don't not want to talk about it. It's just it's a very certain demographic that I just didn't want my podcast to just be about that. Because and you know I didn't want people to just listen to it and be like, ah, it's Jake. It's all he talks about. It's really not, and and uh, it, it's it's more of a part of my past than it is my present, and uh, and. Um, but I've also made some really amazing friendships with people um, during my mixed martial arts career, uh, managing fighters. Not, I wasn't. I wasn't a fighter. I was managing guys. Um, I've, I've met some amazing people in this game, and and I never will regret that. I've met some characters and uh, just some really, really good people, and uh, you know. Uh, and, and Mark was one of those guys that I met a very long time ago. Um, I was managing a handful of guys and, uh, Mark was really one of the first promoters in Western Canada to have a big TV deal. And for anybody who manages fighters, they know that, you know, when you're shopping your guys around, you want to get them the maximum exposures as much as you can. So a TV deal was, was, you know, in was was big. I mean, it still is big, but um, you know, because with exposure on TV comes, you know, more opportunity for fighters to get sponsors and you know, advertising and, and stuff like that, and, and and to get their faces out there for the you know the world to see. So I had met Mark in the man in the infant stages of, uh, I think it was he had just signed the TV deal not too long um, before that we had met. And, uh, and, you know, had quickly established himself as, as a big player in the mixed martial arts game in, in Western Canada. Um, he still has that TV deal. He's, he's on Axis TV. He's, uh, he's got the longest running MMA show on Axis TV. Um, but like I said, I didn't want this podcast to be about mixed martial arts. I wanted it to be about getting to know people and getting to know their backgrounds. And some people have strong opinions of Mark. Some people have um, maybe misconstrued assumptions about Mark, but I can tell you that there's a different person than the promoter. There's a different guy that I know that was from the promoter, and and it it hasn't always been roses. Trust me, we've had falling outs, we've had arguments over contracts, we've had arguments over fighters. Uh, we went probably three years without talking to each other, um, you know. And as friends, I mean that's that's a pretty it's a pretty long time to to not be friends with somebody, but. Uh, but yes, I mean we've had our ups and downs, and 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 I know that in the industry he's got a reputation, and and some of that reputation is some people love the guy, and some people they don't like the guy. But like I said in the interview, when when him and I talk, it's usually ninety percent conversation that has nothing to do with mixed martial arts. It has nothing to do with fights and, and, you know, contracts and deals and stuff like that. I don't, I mean, I don't, I haven't managed anybody that's fought for Mark in a very long time. Um, and, I, I mean, I'm all but out of the management game right now. So, I mean, I don't think I'm going to have anybody that's going to be fighting for Mark. So, there's no incentive. There's no promoting here. There's no, you know, hey, I want to come on the show and, and, you know, promote the next event. And if you listen to the interview... I don't, I don't, I never talked to him about the next event. I mean, we never talk about his show. I mean, we talked about obviously the Maxim Fighting Championship and we talk about how we got into it, but we don't, we don't promote anything because I wanted you to get to know him as a person and, and where he started and how he came up and, and the business sense of things. And I've always admired his, you know, his business savvy and not just in MMA, but in other businesses. And I'm, it's always attracted me to people when they're successful in, in other businesses and, and, and I've got a lot of friends that are successful in a ton of businesses that I can interview. Um, but when I started this podcast, Mark was one of the very first guys to call me. And, and when he listened to the first episode, he called me up and said, Hey man, you know what? Um, I think you got something here. I think you should, 
I think you should keep on going with this, you know? And, and he was always somebody that I wanted to interview because aside from the assumptions and, and, you know, opinions and stuff like that of people, I also want you to get to know the other side of Mark Pavlich. And I think this interview, you'll get to see some of that side and the side that I got to know. So without further ado, kick back, grab a drink, light a cigar and enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. And, uh, I look forward to next week. Down, good Lord. Baby got them open all over town. Strictly bitch, you don't play around. Cover much ground, got game by the town. Getting paid is a forte each and every day to play away. I can't get her out of my mind. I think about the girl all the time. East side to the west side, pushing bad rides. It's no surprise. She got tricks in the stash. When you say the name Mark Pavlich, a lot of words can come to mind. Promoter, businessman, husband, controversial, outspoken, passionate, father, and some can arguably say a pioneer of Canadian mixed martial arts promoting. He's had one of the longest running promotions in the country, the Maximum Fighting Championship. He's managed fighters, taking them from obscurity to the major leagues. An entrepreneur in numerous businesses, and he's still going like he just started out yesterday. I'm pleased and honored to welcome my guest, Mark Pavlich. Mark, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm excited to be here, Jake. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's it seems like it's been forever, and it's funny because we talk all the time, but never, it's, it's, it's like we've had some of the best conversations, and for the longest time, I'm just like, man, I need to... I need to get this down. Like I need to, I need to have this stuff recorded because some of the conversations that you and I've had it is, it's funny because it's like ninety nine percent of it has nothing to do with mixed martial arts. It's been about I think, life. I think that, that's what people. I think that's what people are, are misconstrued about. You know, they they think I have like an obsession with mixed martial arts, and that's the farthest thing from the truth. I mean, mm-hmm. I I watch very little MMA. I I I have an obsession with winning. I have an obsession with succeeding. I have an obsession. With, I have a like bad obsession with 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 shoving dirt in people's mouths that shoot it off. Right. Like I, I re- not not physically. Yeah. You know, I, I just really do. I, I I just that's my thrill. Like I really I do. I really get excited about it. <laughs> you know, right. like people are like what do you do for pastime? I love shoving dirt in people's mouths <laughs> that shoot their mouths off. You know, that's that, that's the truth, man. I mean, I love that. And you know what I love about it too? You never hear me talk about it when I do it though you right. just know it happened right you know what I'm saying right and that's my favorite thing I don't go when I do it I don't go and jump around and say hey I did it I shoved dirt in that person's mouth no they're choking on the dirt and I'm I'm in my office celebrating right. that I did that <laughs> popping champagne we're popping champagne around here, man. Well, there's no lie, and then that's it. And then, and then people, people, and then I, and I don't rebuttal people anymore. I don't, I don't get into like verbal stuff with people anymore, you know, because I, I look at them, you know, I almost feel sorry for most of them now, mm-hmm. right? Before I used to have like, like this kind of obsession with crushing them, and now it's like I just have this kind of empathy. It's almost weird, like Gandhi kind of right. thing about it. It's because I don't want to, I don't want to have that in my DNA anymore, which also scares me because I think you have to have that in your dna to be successful mm-hmm. how, how much of it is a chess match for you i mean because you know like you said you're not out there you know bashing other promotions you're not out there you know trying to you know throw dirt on people so to speak but is it just a sense of just kind of sitting back and watching competitors and and, and people in the business you see them making mistakes and you it's just a matter of time Watching. I think the mistake, but Jake, I think the mistakes are so big now that you don't even have to be intelligent to even see the people making mistakes. It's, just, it's a consistent thing. It's been happening for 15 years that I've been in this business. You just over and over again, you see the same mistake over and over and over again. And, and, and it's funny because I really don't pay attention to anybody. I don't, I, I you know, when it comes up, people talk about it. I, I kind of sometimes I'll engage, but I don't engage like I used to engage in it in the conversation. It's like, I, I don't even know what to say anymore, man. It's like, uh, like, it, it, it's like, it's like making fun of people that can't defend themselves. Right. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know what to say to people. Like, you know, people say, oh, this promoter's talking crap about you. I'm like, I, 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 listen, I don't even know who those, like, I don't know them. Right. right, and they don't know me, and it's like, 
they're not having dinner with me. They're not hanging out with me at church. They're not hanging out with me at the gym. I don't I, like they don't know who I am. So mm-hmm. it's like you know, it's like it's like me if I start randomly t- talking about Lady Gaga and I don't like her. You know what I mean? Like, right. I don't know her. She don't know me. Right. So it's just ridiculous, right? So it's like it's different. If we if we sat down a lot of times and we had long discussions, and then you went on a rant about me, then I say, okay, there's something that I did that I did not. You know, I must have did something wrong to make that person do that. Right. But that never ha- it's never happened in my lifetime. Right. Well, speaking of lifetime, I want to start from the very beginning. Your dad, NHL linesman, member of the Hockey Hall of Fame. What was it like growing up with him as your dad? Oof. It was violent. You know, it's not. It's not. A, it's not like. A, you know, it's not a hidden thing. I'm past it now. I mean, my wife's. My wife, you know, fixed that whole situation with him and I, and mm-hmm. um, if she didn't, maybe we'd, we'd still be in that situation to this day. Right. But she felt the need that she thought psychologically that I needed to fix that with him, which I did. And now we're, you know, we, we, we're the best of friends. We talk lots, but, you know, he came up in the old, olden days, right? And that's just the kind of way he was, you know? He, 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 he just, he just kind of came up, you know, and he might, you know, he always had kind of a mean temper and he just... I don't know. That's just the way he was. Now he's mellow. I mean, he's 80 years old, but he, he's right. mellow now. But when we, when he was, uh, you know, it was, you know, that's just the way it was. You know, it's like you had to have, you have to have your hands up at the dinner table. You know what I'm yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it was with him. And you know, and, and like I said, I don't, I don't, I don't. I feel that there's a lot of things to that now too that I realize that he did teach me about certain things that I, you know, my dad has a a, a ton of ethics besides that kind of stuff. He he has a lot of integrity too. That's what I realized. He 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 doesn't waver, and my mother's the same way. And it's like that's that's the thing I can really do. I really do take from them. You know, mm-hmm. they're not they're not shifty people. They're not they're not like that. You right. know, they're very they're very square, and I admire that. Right. Where did you grow up? I grew up the most of my life in Windsor, Ontario. And then when I was very young, I moved and, and I moved to Vancouver and then I, I moved to Las Vegas and then I moved. I, I was, a, I was a, a, a gypsy, you know, I moved right. around a lot. I was, a, you know, I was trying to find, you know, what I was going to do with my life. And I knew even at a young age that something, you know, great was going to happen. And I'm 46 and I'm still waiting for something great to happen. And <laughs> so it's like... You know, like people say, oh, you're a big MMA show, and you're this and that, and you do your business with Mark Cuban and, you know, TSN before and all that other stuff. To me, that's not going to define me when I die. I don't, I, I never thought that. I never, I never sit around and think, oh, yeah, you know, that's the, you know, make a plaque. No, man, I, I, I'm going to do something, like, in my lifetime. And, it, and you know what's funny? I always think, too, it's going to be more on the humanitarian side than it will be on a business side. Right. I think, I, I think business-wise, uh, that's always been kind of an easy thing for me. I think that I, I'm going to do something major on that end. You mm-hmm. know, I'm not going to just go feed some people and that's going to be like, oh, here I am, I'm saving the world. You know, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about I know how to get things done. I know how to make I know how to move things around. I know how to do those type of things. And I think that I would be best suited for that one day in my life. You know, right. I really, I really have a tug to do that type of stuff. What was it like growing up in Windsor? That, and for the listeners that, that don't know, that, that's, that's, correct me if I'm wrong, it's really close to the border, right? Well, I grew up in, I, I say to people, I, was, I, I, I lived in Windsor, but I grew up in Detroit. There's no question. I never. <laughs> it's a tough town, I, I, man. I never. I. I. Windsor and Detroit are separated by the Detroit River, which is one mile long. Right. I. So I was fascinated with Detroit. I. I grew up in Detroit. I never grew up in Windsor. Um, I lived in Windsor, but I grew up in Detroit. I was fascinated with it. I was never scared to go anywhere. Um, that was probably naiveness when I was young. Right. But maybe stupid. But I really was obsessed with like. You know, I walked in the Kronk gym when I was a kid. I was the only white kid that was in the gym. Right. You know, and I was like, I was like, I didn't realize maybe that's naiveness or stupidity. I'm not sure. But I, I walked in the gym and I was the only white person in the gym. And I was like, I didn't realize that I was the only white person in the gym <laughs> because I was so enthralled to be in Kronk gym. Right. And I was just like, I was in awe. And, and, and then, you know, someone walked up to me and said, you know, 
I, I think you're in the wrong place. <laughs> and I'm like, no, is this Kwong Jim? And they're like, yeah, this is Kwong Jim. I'm like, no, no, I'm in the right spot, man. Yeah, they're like, no, and, you and got I, fucking I, lost, man. You're, you're, yeah, you're yeah, in the wrong building. Yeah, but they building. thought I got Someone was being nice about it. Like, you know, you're in the wrong place. I mean, you're the only white person in this whole place, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I didn't care. I was like, I just want to learn how to box, man. I want to, I want to punch and I want to do stuff. And, I, you know, that's just the way it was. And then when, when I, you know, people said, oh, there's this place to get Coney dogs. And I would like, oh, where is it? It's called Coney Island, but it's in Detroit and it's in this ghetto area. And I was like, I don't care. The best, they're the best Coney. And I would walk there and I would walk around. I'm like, oh my God, I, I, I definitely didn't belong in right. this area. Right. But I didn't care, man. I just, just never had that mentality. Like, you know, I was never scared when I was there. And people always talk about how bad Detroit is. I, I, I loved it. I still love it. I'm still in love with that city. I'm always going to be in love with that city. I get I get goosebumps when I go back there all the time. I'm still a Detroit Lions fan, Detroit Red Wings, Detroit Tigers, Detroit Pistons. <laughs> that those are my teams, man. I don't waver, you know, like those are my that's my guys, you know, and it's like I love the people there. I love the food. I I don't know. I I I know it gets a bad knock because of the economy and stuff like that, but I right. love it. Yeah, it's you know it's it's a town with a lot of history too. You know, I, I was I just saw a documentary on on uh, on this. Uh, they, they were considered the very first punk band. It was a, a band called Death, and it was these three black brothers, and nobody knew about them. They just somebody just dug up this uh, this you know tape by by these three guys, his record, and they didn't even know 30 years later that their stuff is being played at punk shows and skateboarding places and stuff. Yeah. And, and I mean, they were before the Ramones, like they had the sound. It, it was incredible. But anyway, the documentary goes into Detroit and, and you know, the, the economy and the, and the history there and, you know, the automotive business. And it, it, it is sad to see, you know, what that town has kind of become, but, but it seems to be a bit of a surge of, of, you know, some, some, uh, um, revitalization there, which is good. Which is good. Yeah, and win Windsor across the border is doing horrible right now. And you know, I, when I grew up there as a kid, it was doing awesome. Right. And it, and it, but now it's just doing really bad, and it, I hate to see that, man. I, I just do. I just hate it. And you know, I, I, when I do go back there, I, I just have I have so many friends that still like that I keep in contact with from even high school and grade school. I keep up with those people. Right. And it's and it's just like yeah, it breaks my heart. I hate to see them suffering like that. You know, but. You know, a lot of those people that are my friends, they they, they won't go anywhere else, man. They, they that's there, home, huh? No, yeah. No matter what, that's their house. You know, that's yeah. their place, and they're not going anywhere. That's interesting. Tell me about high school. What kind of kid were you growing up? I was shy all the time, man. I don't know why. I was just. I I think I had a deficiency as a, as a child that I, I socially I just I never spoke up. I just kind of stayed quiet, and you know, then I got in some scenarios when I was younger and. Some people took my shyness for arrogance, which was not the case, and mm -hmm. then they they thought, oh, geez, he's been arrogant or something, you know. And I was like, no, nah, I wasn't arrogant, man. I was just shy. I didn't want to, I didn't want confrontation with people. I didn't want any type of stuff. And then as time went on, I got in confrontation with people because of that in high school, right? right. You know, physical confrontations, and then I that kind of helped me in a way as a kid in high school to get me out of my shell because when someone was punching me in the face, I had to punch back. Right. Right. So then, so then I punch back and then I get really mad because I'm like, I'm not this person, but I was upset. So I would fight back out of, out of fear that I was going to get hurt. And then I would do well. Mm -hmm. And then, then for some reason that was kind of like my, my, my way of feeling, getting more confidence because I never picked a fight in my life. But then when I started to fight, I, I felt like, okay, I was more comfortable doing that. Even as a child, it was weird. It was a very right. weird like, way to, to grow up with that mentality. Well, it's, it's pretty I ironic, too, that you're in a business where you're, you're very social. You're very out in front of the camera. Um, you and I have spent a lot of personal time together, and you're a very different person when you're not promoting. But did you feel that spark when you were a kid growing up? Did you always know you were meant to do something more than what you were doing, what your buddies were going to do? And I, you know, I'd imagine in Windsor, there's probably, you know, like you said, a lot of guys that, that still are there, you know, they grow up and, and just like a lot of friends that I had in, in high school, you know, they, you know, be, work in factories or they, you know, end up working for their old man in the shop or something like that. Did you have that spark in high school? Did you always know that I needed to get out of this town or, or did no, it take I, you I a bit? The spark. When I met Mano, that was the spark because she, he saw me bigger than I saw myself. 
Mm-hmm. And that was that was the, the the key factor because I saw myself as someone that would do well in life and that would kind of be the end of it. Mano saw me as being something special mm-hmm. and I I bought into it, I believed it, and that was the difference. There's no there's no question on that whatsoever. You know, she I remember we were in the entertainment business and I lost a lot of money at one point. And I remember being in my office and she came down there and she was like, come on, man, you know, guys like you, 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 you know, she gave me that speech, you know, right. the, the speech about you're the man, you know, right. and, and maybe someone else's girlfriend or wife at that time would have said, you're an idiot. What were you doing? You know, right. but she didn't do that speech. She did the opposite speech. Like, come on, man, you know, grab them, right. strap them back on, get out there. You know, you're the man. This is nothing. This is going to be nothing in five years from now. Nothing. And that was a lot of money. And and she was right. You know, it was just, just the mentality that, you know, that she was always there putting me in front of everybody. Right. And I always, I always kind of felt sad about it because I thought Mano on her own could have been something, you know, besides, you know, working with MSC and this and that. I always thought that Mano could have, um, like, I don't care what it was. She could have been like a monster business person. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And she said to me one day when I asked her, and it almost broke my heart when I said, you know, what was your dream in life, Mano? You know, because I wanted to know because she was always worried about what Dave's dream was or what Kayla's dream was or what my dream was. And I said, what was your dream? And you know what she said? She said, my dream was that you all be happy. Wow. And that was her dream in life. And I was like, you're kidding. And she says, nope, that's all I ever wanted. I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that you were happy, that Dave was happy, that Kayla was happy. And that, that made me, that was my, that was my goal to make sure that happened. I've known your wife for, for as long as I've known you and we've had dinners together. We've, we spent a lot of time, uh, hanging out and stuff. Um, and for the listeners that don't know, Mano is your wife. How long have you guys been married for? Oh, we've been together for 27 years. You know? 27 it's, years. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. And it's like, but it doesn't seem like that at all. Like when we work, we're business partners. And then when we don't work, we're not. Mm-hmm. Where she's my wife and my right. girlfriend, I say to that too, right? And and, and I and that's kind of how I always looked at her. But when we work, it's totally different. It's it's not like we're together as husband and wife. And she works so hard, man. I have, we get, yeah. Oh, it's crazy, it's dude. Crazy. I've I've it, never it, seen it, it, somebody it, promote as hard and as passionately as their husband does. Um, I've been in her presence when people are calling her for tickets, man. She upsells tickets. She, you know, hey, I remember hearing, uh, I remember being there one time when there was a phone call that came in and said, uh, uh, I need, uh, I need seven tickets to the show tonight. And she said, seven, what are you talking about? Seven's the most unluckiest number you can have, man. You need to get eight. You, I, you know, I don't care if yeah. you give it away to a fucking bum, but you need to order eight of these fucking tickets. <laughs> That's you know so what I mean? true, man. She, uh, she, yeah, dude, she hustles, man. It's it's unbelievable. No, I've always the, been. No, she's the. You know, people always say that to me. They're like, "Oh, Mark, you you know you 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 hustle and do this stuff." Mano showed me how to hustle, man. Mano is the original hustler of hustlers. You know, and I mean, <laughs> I don't mean hustler in a bad way. I mean hustler in the most positive sense of the word. <laughs> right, right. Mano just straight hustler. She she just the whole the, redefines the whole meaning of hustling how did you, know? you guys meet um we were in montreal i saw her you know i i thought oh i'm gonna i'm gonna you know my best part of my game was verbal so i i went up to her the first girl i ever went up to you know in person to, like i never ever ever went up to a girl and asked her to dance or hang out with me or ever mm-hmm. and i and Mano was the first that i i approached and um i started talking to her and then i realized you know, halfway during my spiel that she couldn't speak a word of English. And so, so that, that, that posed a gigantic problem because I couldn't speak a word of French. You know, I had to call my brother back in the day on, you know, those big monster cell phones that you right. needed like, you know, four hands, you know, you needed four hands to carry these things around with. And I called my brother who spoke French and he convinced her that I was a good guy. And you know, the rest you could say is history. Wow. And, and, have you always been an entrepreneur growing up or, or did you have regular jobs out of high school or what was the path you took after high school? No, I, even when I was in high school, I was hustling all the time, man, like on a, on a lower level, but right. you know, my friends were painting fences. I would rent a, a boat and have a boat cruise with a DJ, 
<laughs> you know, honestly, you, you know, that's what I from an early age. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was doing. You know, I was like, I was like, my friends are like painting fences. You know, and when Windsor was 110 degrees outside, yeah. and I'm like, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not doing that, man. And it's like, they're like, Mark, yeah, come paint fences with them. I'm like, no, you guys want to go to a boat cruise? And they're like, who's putting it on? I'm like, you're looking at them, <laughs> woohoo! You know, and that's that's what happened. Straight up stories. You know, and it's like I rented the boat, got a DJ back in the day when people didn't even know what a DJ was, right? And and I got the DJ, and you know, you paid fifteen dollars to come on the boat cruise and that's where i was making more money than my teachers when i was in high school <laughs> so who were so, your biggest influences growing up i mean did you have family around did you have friends around that you looked up to or, or did you kind of venture out on your own and and, no, and just figure marty, stuff out my uncle marty was my guy he's still alive right now he's 87 80 years old he's out he played for the red wings and he was my guy like he was the the most positive human being i ever met my whole entire life and he, you know, he's a multi gazillionaire and he, he you know, he made his money in the plastics business and mm -hmm. you know, he, he was my guy and he's he's still my guy. You know, he's my main guy for that kind of stuff and he's just he's just you know, he's that guy. He's the he's the guy that, you know, believes that anything you can that I could do and he believes you know, he was another one of those positive people in my life that was always you know, you're the man, Mark, you can do this. Like whatever, you know, he, when I signed deals with Mark Cuban and stuff like that, he didn't think it was a big deal. You know, he right. expected, he expected that, you know, right. and I, that's what I liked about him. Like I saw myself, I saw myself like, you know, like it was such a big deal and he downplayed it. Like, really? You know, that, 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 that doesn't surprise me at all. Right. You know what I mean? Right. You, you know, if I told him I was going to the moon, you know, on a on a paper airplane, he would think that I should be able to do that, you know. Right. So, so that's that was that was his mentality, it, and see, that's the perception factor that right. you sit there and go, "Oh, wait a second, really? You think I can do that?" <laughs> that's amazing to have in your life, though. You know, were your parents behind you? Like when you when you? I mean, obviously, you got a long history of the NHL in your background, a lot of hockey. Um, the sports route. Did, did were you pushed in that direction at all, or were your parents just kind of say, "Find your own way"? Yeah, I wasn't really pushed, really. You know, I just no, I like I played hockey and that kind of stuff, but there wasn't like a, you know, an overabundance of uh, of support in those areas. Right. Just say that, right? Right. You know, I I kind of figured my own stuff out. When did you? make the move from living out east to moving out to west take me through that what how did you start off with well that? i went to vancouver right i was i was in windsor and i was in vancouver and i was like i thought that i would just go to vancouver and that i would i would make money just because i thought i could make money i was young too i was like 16 and a half 17 years old and when i went out there i went with 326 dollars right wow. so i took a limousine this is a true story i flew to vancouver one-way ticket from Windsor, Ontario to Vancouver, Canada, one-way ticket, $326, and I took a limo. This is, was my mentality, okay? I took a limo from the airport <laughs> to downtown Vancouver to this Granville Hotel that was $7 a day. Holy shit. So, so I took a limo that cost $30 <laughs> out of the $326 that I had to the front <laughs> so that, this is a true story. To the front door of this Granville Hotel with my friend, it was $7 for me and it was $7 for him. It was $14 a day to stay at this hotel. It had three channels on the television, clean sheets, and I went to Vancouver thinking, oh, I'm just going to get a job anywhere, you know. And then I walked the streets of Vancouver for a good month and I was down to like eating at the all-day buffet all day, right? <laughs> <He's> and, then, <laughs> and then we walked by this bar one day, and this girl came out, and she said, hey, what do you do, you know? And I'm like, yeah, nothing, right? You know, we're basically looking for work, you know? Right. But we had a great suntan, and, you know, and we, <laughs> were above average, <laughs> and we were above average looking, and we didn't look homeless, right? Right. So, so she said, what do you guys do, you know? She goes, this bar just opened. Do you guys know, you, you, what can you guys do, you know? I'm like, and I looked at my friend, and I'm like, hey, we know how to bartend. You know, we didn't have the first clue how to bartend. And <laughs> I just had to throw something out there. We, need, we needed a job, you know. You just had the but, heat lamp uh, buffet tan going, right? Yeah, we had For, the tan going, and we, we looked the roll, but we were dead broke. Didn't we didn't know the first cents. thing about bartending. We didn't, yeah, hey, you know, hey, if you order a beer, I know how to open it. You know, that was kind of my, the extent of my bartending career. Right. And, uh, so then she said, well, I'll introduce you to the owners of the place, right? 
So I said, sure. And the girl was Miss Vancouver, you know, the beauty yeah. pageant girl. Yeah. So she said, she she saw these two young studs walking the streets all tanned, got us a job at this place. So the next day, there we were, man. We were bartending in Vancouver, and we, we, just just in time, the funds were running out. You know, <laughs> we were we we were down to the nitty gritty, eating at the all day buffet all day, two story, and we ended up being bartenders. And then you know, the, the course took it. You know, then after a while, you know, we got some money going, and you know. What was the, what was your first uh, foray into the entrepreneur world? What was your first business? You entertainment business. Entertainment, entertainment business. business. Yeah, I, I started entertainment business. I used to have an obsession. I no, I still have an obsession with Las Vegas. But I went to Las Vegas. I saw lots of shows. So I I produced a lot of shows that were from Las Vegas that went on the road. So not Vegas shows, but shows that I visually saw in Las Vegas. I put together and. What I did was, I was once again naive, and I said, I'm not going to pay an agency to, to, to book this show. I'm going to book it. I'm not going to pay, I'm going to pay choreographers and costume makers, mm -hmm. but I'm going to put the show together myself. And then when the show's put together, I'm not going to get an agency to book it. I'm going to book it. Right. So instead of making 15% or 10%, I made 85%. I did the opposite. So I came up with a whole different philosophy, and I never did stuff with music bands and things like that because the bands at that time weren't making any money. Right. I did novelty acts, right? You name it: comedy, hypnotists, female drag shows, male male dance shows, uh, female foxy boxing. You mm -hmm. name it. I did every show that you. I had hypnotists. I had magicians. I had you name it. But the shows were all put together through me. I, I put them together, I named them, I costumed them, I did everything, and I ate the initial expense. But after the initial expense, when I booked them, I would pay the act X amount of dollars, and I kept the rest. <laughs> wow. And, and yeah. so, and, and, and how far did this business go? Was it across Canada? Was it, was it province-wide? Oh, we're in across North America, right? The whole thing, into Hawaii, into Hawaii, you name all those places. Like I, you know, people used to joke all the time. They say, oh, have you ever been to this city? And I'm like, I have, you know? And they're like, you know, really? What, what, what's the name of the city? And I'd be like, you know, I don't care what the name is. I've been there. You right. Know? <laughs> so it didn't matter. And I, I used to make, it used to be an ongoing joke because people would walk up to me and go, hey, have you ever been to Flim Flam, Manitoba? I'm like, yeah, twice, you know? <laughs> Uh, have you ever been to Valdosta, Georgia? I'm like, yeah, three, four times. You know, I'm like, what? You know, like, and I'm not kidding you, man. I've been there. I've been to all those Tallahassee, Florida. You name it, like the weird places, the big places, small places. I was I was on the road at one point for two years straight with with four or five days off at Christmas, and the four or five days I was off during Christmas, I almost went nuts wow. because I did not want to. I did not want to stop the momentum of what I was doing. I was so obsessed with keeping this rolling. And I was off. No, I'm not kidding you. I was either five or six days off, and I and I I just I had to go back on the road. I had to see what was going on with my business at all times, and I couldn't stand being off. And where was Mano during all this? Did she go with you, or or was were you based out well, of the at city that time, somewhere? At that, time, at that time, was the beginning stages of Mano. Like right. at that time, right? So that's that's the beginning stages of of when I met Mano, and then then that was a problem too because when I had the entertainment business. I didn't know, but at one point I fell in love with Mano, right? And mm -hmm. then I said, oh, no, I fell in love with this girl. And then I, I wanted her around all the time because she was so funny and good looking. And I was like, every time I was with her, I was just laughing all the time. And I'm like, oh, she's good looking too, right? And then she's funny. So I was like, oh, she always makes me laugh. And I'm not the most jovial human being in the world, right? So it, and, and I don't think things are funny either lots of times. You know, like mm -hmm. I go to comedy shows and I'm like, I don't laugh. Right. Because I don't, I don't think they're funny. And, and I don't even fake laugh. I'm just like, they're not funny. <laughs> and um, But Mano was legitimately funny. So I found myself always wanting to be around her. And then when we were in the entertainment business, she got involved, too, on the back end, like taking care of certain things for me. Right. And then it, it was weird because I was like, well, there she goes. Like she started becoming part of my businesses, but just helping me all the time. Right. And then I started realizing when we got into the mixed martial art business – we didn't make one dollar until Mano got involved. Wow. Yeah, because she she saw things that I didn't see. And she didn't care about MMA. She didn't care about mixed martial arts. She didn't care about nothing. She cared about making money. Right. You know what I mean? So people got that 
confused. Like Manoa, Manoa has never sat around and watched the UFC on TV. You know what I mean? Right, <laughs> right. Only the time that she came was when I was training guys in the UFC, fighting in the UFC, and then she would she would come and support me. She could care less about you know what was going on there. Interesting. Now, yeah. Now, well, the one thing I know that you're you know you're the most passionate about. Is your family? I've spent a lot of time with them, and and I've seen just how dedicated you are, not only as a father but also as a husband. When did the kids come along? Well, people don't understand. You know, when I was sitting around as a kid, when you know during that time when I was young, young, and walking the streets and doing all that other stuff. You know what my dream? My dream was easy. You know, people go, oh, "I want to be a fireman. I want to be this. I want to be playing NHL." My dream was to have like a really nice house with a really nice family. Right. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. What I dream, what I was dreaming in my dreams, it was, and I know it's not a large goal for people. You know, like people think, well, that that's not that big of a deal. I'm like, no, no, it is a big deal to have the way I wanted it was a big deal. And in my dream was never as good as it turned out. Like what's what what is happening now is ten times better than what I dreamt. Right. So, which is crazy. Which is crazy because you go. Wait, I dreamt this as a kid, man. I dreamt like having a nice house. And the house that I was dreaming about, my house is 10 times nicer than the one in the dream. <laughs> and then I was dreaming of like having a nice wife. And I'm like, Mano looks 10 times better than the one I was dreaming about. And <laughs> That's then, I, the one and you then my kids. Yeah, and then like my kids are genetic masterpieces, right? So it's like, you know, I, I dreamt about having kids. And then I'm like, well, wait a second. I didn't, they're like, not my kids are like, they look like models, right? So I'm like, that, that wasn't in my dreams either, right? <laughs> so I'm like, this is insanity, man. You know what I mean? Like, it's crazy. So for me, I'm like overwhelmed by this, all this stuff. I'm not like bragging about it. I'm overwhelmed by it all. Right, right. I still am, even right now while I'm talking to you, when I just said what I said, I'm overwhelmed by it. I am. I'm like, it's like weird. It's like, when I, and I think back when I was a kid and the exact places I was when I was dreaming all this stuff, and then it came true, and I was like, this is so weird to me, you know? Tell me a bit about Edmonton, and, and what was it like when you got there? Were you still in the entertainment business, or, or, or were you starting to get into the mixed martial art business? But tell me about when you first got to that city, and, and how did you know that that was a place where you're going to stay? Well, it was crazy because I, I, we had shows here on tour, so I came here. But I've never been to Edmonton. So I came here and it was like 90 below. <laughs> like it was crazy. <laughs> like I'm not joking. It was some record crazy cold, right? And I'm like, this is insanity. But what happened was I walked in one of the establishments where, where I had the entertainment. And when I walked in there, the guy that owned all the places, he owned like at that time like 14 or 15 establishments. Right. And he, when I walked in, I came in in a suit. He, he said, he thought I played like in NHL or something, right? Right. And then, and then he stopped me and he said, who are you? And I'm like, I, I own, uh, you know, the entertainment company that you, that you, you know, that you have. He's like, man, the stuff you have is just awesome. It's great. I'm like, hey, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. He says, you ever think about moving to Edmonton? And I started laughing at the guy, right? And I was like, what, are you crazy, bro? It's 90, 90 below zero outside. <laughs> right. I'm never going to move here. Are you nuts? And he's like, he's like, well, I'll tell you what. I will, I will write down on this napkin how much money you can make. And the other guy that owned the other entertainment business, he was in the same establishment me at the time. Right. He was bragging to me how much money he was making. Right, and then the owner of all these establishments said, basically, like I'm going to give you his stuff. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, going to give you his 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 business. His business, right. but he didn't even know that, right? Because I was already saying that I would never move to Edmonton. I would never. So this is a true story. After the story goes, I end up stopping for a coffee. That person is in the same place where I am getting the coffee. He says to me. I have no competition here. He doesn't even know that the owner told me that he, he's going to give me the bill. It's crazy. Right? He has no idea he's about to, to go tits up then. If I move to Edmonton. Right. 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 <laughs> this is a true story. I swear, I swear on a stack of Bibles, this is a true story. So he says, he says to me, that I have no competition. But I think he heard me say that I would never move to Edmonton, right? Right. So he, he kept saying to me when I'm getting my coffee, because he remembered who I was, he was, I could see that he was a pitch intimidated, not by me as a person, but me as a business. He was intimidated. 
he kept saying to me, I have no competition. It's unbelievable how my businesses, I'm making so much money, blah, blah, blah. At this time, I'm thinking to myself, in the process where he's bragging about his whole life to me, I thought to myself, I could be in one place. I could be with my with Mano. I could be, you know, because I had Dave, Dave then, right? Mm-hmm. I can be in one spot with everybody. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But but it still was a crazy idea because I walked outside. It was still ninety below zero outside. <laughs> Not exactly the best sales pitch to get you in. No, no. But but the, what this guy said to me, and his name was Pat. I remember. He said to me, he that he has no competition. He was telling me the amounts of money he was making, and then the owner of all these establishments said, "I'm gonna. I, I want you to move to Edmonton." So, I said to my wife, I called her and I said do you want to move to Edmonton? And she said, are you nuts? But I told her the amount of money, right? And she says, well, I can sell the place. Here. <laughs> <laughs> we, live, we, lived in, we lived in Hall, Quebec, you know? And, I said, and she said, well, we can get rid of it, Mark, you know? And I said, yeah, I think we should come here, you know? I have a feeling about this. But it was crazy because what it really was is it was, it was, uh, like a, it was a kid move because he was throwing mud in my face. I was going to say. And I, he, wanted to th- yeah. and I wanted to throw it back. That's the whole reason why I came to Edmonton. That's a true story. So what I did was, this is the craziest thing I ever did. I found out where that gentleman's office was. This is a true story on a stack of Bibles. I, I, I never went back east. I stayed here the whole time. I found out where his office was. Ironically, there was an office space right next door to him. <laughs> Don't tell this me you rented this place out. Man. So, to, so there was an office space next to his. I went there to see where his office was. And what I did was I rented the space right next door to his. <laughs> so this was this is a true story. <laughs> on a Friday, I rented the space. On Monday morning... I went in there with a makeshift desk. I went in there with, you know, had a phone line set up. I paid extra to have the phone line set up. (laughs) I left the door wide open. And I'm not kidding you. I had a piece of paper on the front door with the name of my company because I didn't have time to get signs made or nothing yet, right? (laughs) Right. (laughs) So So I left the door purposely open. I put my feet up on the desk. I went to talk on the phone. I was ta- I can't even remember who I was talking to. But whatever the conversation was with the person I was talking to, it immediately changed when that person walked in the door. <laughs> he walked in the door. He walked by my desk. This is, don't forget, on the Thursday prior, he was just telling me how he was, gonna, he was the man that no one had no competition. And what I did was <laughs> he walked in, and I changed the conversation on my phone immediately. I was talking to somebody about business, and I immediately said, yeah, we're going to do this, and I just went on this rant about what I was going to do. This guy walked by my office. He did like a, a quadruple take, like he saw my face, and he couldn't believe it. He was in his office, and I started to speak louder because our office were now not just next door to each other. They were attached. And I was telling the person on the phone, oh, yeah, we're taking clubs up in Calgary, and we're going out to Vancouver. And I started speaking louder. Like we're taking even the louder West by storm. We're and the guy, on the, other line, the guy on the other line, all he's saying to me is, Mark, why are you talking so loud? What are you talking about? <laughs> I just started going crazy. Right? This guy comes into my office. He's, he's uh, like beyond upset, right? And I said to him, Hold on one second, John, on the phone. I said, excuse me, I have a business call. Can you please exit my office? (laughs) He exited the office, and he was absolutely in a state of shock, right? And then then when I hung up the phone, he comes back to my office. I swear to God, knocks on the office door. He says, what do you think you're doing, right? And I said... Well, you know what was funny? You inspired me while I was having a coffee and it was minus 90 below outside (laughs) that you said you had no competition. There was no other competition. I figured I had a shot at making some money because if you had no competition, I would be your only competitor. (laughs) I think that's probably the best story I've ever heard, man. This guy's jaw dropped to the floor. This is a true story on a stack of of a million Bibles. I said, what's going to happen right now is we're in a fight. There's only going to be one of us standing. I guarantee it. It might not even be me. 
Jake. I'm not even being arrogant at all. Right. I just thought to myself, I thought maybe they'd be, you go to some businesses, there's 50 competitors. Maybe there's 100 competitors, right? <laughs> He said to me, there is no other competitor for me. This is it. I'm the guy. There's nobody else. I said, I'm taking a shot at this, right? I want a shot at the belt, right? And, uh, you know, as his, I, I don't want to sound, you know, grandiose about anything, but, you know, six months later, he was not in business anymore. He didn't even live in the city, right? He was done. But, <laughs> no, but, but you know what's funny? I didn't put him out of business. He put himself out of business because... I never tried to put him out of business. I just tried to acquire as much business as I could possibly get my hands on. Not once I thought about him after that day. That's what people are misconstruing all the time. After the first day is I gave him the initial shock factor. Right. I never thought about him ever again. Never. I never thought about him at all. He, you know what's funny? The only time I thought about him was to play practical jokes. And the pra- jokes I played on him was, I asked the building guy, I said, what time does he come to work at? He said, 8 o'clock, right? So I would come to work at 7.30. So, when, so he would come <laughs> in at 7.30. Be there before he was. Yeah, so the guy that ran the building was a super good guy. He was originally from out east. We just got along really well. You know, he's an Italian guy. I, I, I'm Croatian. We got talking. We were like, we became like friends, you know? So I said, so, so the next day, he, so I figure, he went and asked the guy, he says, what time does he get in at? He says, 7.30, right? So the next day, so I said, tell him I get in at 7.30, right? So it was like playing in a fixed card game. He had no clue what was going on. I said, so what I did was, I can't, so he shows up at 7.30, but I show up at 7. <laughs> so he says to the guy, he said, what time did he come in at? You know, he said, you just missed him by a minute or so, you know? So the next day he tells him, I swear this is a true story, he says, he comes, he's coming in at 6 a.m. now. He said, this savage guy is crazy, man. He came in at 6 a.m. So the next day, I set my alarm. It was crazy. Like that, I've never, I don't get up at that time, but that one time, I got up at 5.30, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> this guy shows up at 6 a.m. He's never showed up to work in his life at 6 a.m., right? He shows up at 6 a.m. I'm there at 5.30, right? I'm delirious. But he, he walks in. I got the phone going. He's like, who, the, who are you talking to at 5.30 in the morning, right? And I said, I said to him, I swear to God, I said, I'm speaking to my clients in Japan. <laughs> he, I wasn't talking to anybody, okay? He, the guy went crazy. He, he was like, I was torturing him without even trying to torture him. I was like playing practical jokes. The, the Italian guy, he was laughing all the time because he, he was there before all of us every day, right? But he said it was the craziest thing he ever saw. Oh, my God. And, and what happened was, what the moral of the story, what happened was, I realized this a long time ago. I realized it when I was really young and when I was doing that. I never wanted anybody to ever do that to me. But what I realized was is no one could ever do that to me if I only concentrate on what I was doing. Right, right. So that was the kind of the moral of the story. I was teaching myself a lesson at the same time I was teaching Pat a lesson, right? <laughs> because at any time, Pat could have said, I don't care what time he comes into work. I don't care what he does. Right. I don't care about none of that stuff. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to out-hustle this guy. That's the only thing I'm going to concentrate on. Right, right. right. So me, I was concentrating on how much business I can acquire. I'm going to outwork everybody. Uh, and I would make up imaginary people that I'm going to outwork. And I'm going to go and hustle I'm gonna, when I'm going to make more phone calls. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to go meet more people. And then he was out of business after six to eight months after that. You know? But that's just kind of how that, that, that started. But it's a funny story, but it's a, it's a lesson for everybody to learn. You know, when MMA shows were going out of business, people would call me and say, oh, you know, Mark, you put them out of business. I'm like, no, I didn't put nobody out of business. They put themselves out of business. Right. If the MFC goes out of business, nobody would ever put me out of business. I put myself out of business. That's how it works. So being, I don't even know if I, if I would use the term competitive, but but seeing those types of, of, of life practices and the amount of work that you put into into the jobs that you do and the businesses that you have, do you need that competitive spirit? Do you have to have people yes. that are constantly biting yes. at your heels? Yes, yes, I know that for sure. Because I think, I just realized as I get older now that I can get borderline complacent mm-hmm. when I don't have no one to fight with. And that, 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 
that's just the way it is. My mom used to say that all the time. She said, if he doesn't have someone to fight with, he just can't function properly. Right, and, right. And, and, and I, 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 I know that to be very true now. I, I need stuff to put me on tilt to work harder. I, I, before it was just I would make up reasons to do it all the time, but now it's, it's a little bit different. It is. It's like as I get older now, it's like, you know, I need people to pick fights with me. I need to make up imaginary fights, you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> Well, Maximum Fighting Championship, it's, you've had uh, 43 events, um, they've had over 403 matches, your your promotion is one of the longest, if not the longest running show in Canada, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, you've got... It is, but the, you know what's funny, I listen, I, and I'll straighten this out just once and for all, mm -hmm. people think that we're the, we're the longest, and uh, then there's people that debate it and think that... Other people are longer. We're the longest legal running MMA show. Right. There's other shows that came, like, there's one around that, but it wasn't technically legal. Right. So I, I never counted that. You know what I mean? Right, right. So that's one thing that people really need to understand. It's not, it's not you know, what it, it, the, the facts are the facts, right? We, right. We, we're the longest legal running in Canada, we're even, even no offense, but that, you know, the, the one that Terry Troublecock runs to the majority of those shows were illegal too, as well. Mm -hmm. So you can't say, you know, people say, people say I'm the, the second longest running show in the world. Some people say I'm the third, you know, right. but it's like even King of the Cage, the more American version, more, a lot of those shows were illegal that he was putting on when he first started. Right. So when was his real start point? You know, when he started, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. So most people that are in the know say, well, the MFC is the second longest running show in the world, right? Right, right. Now, your yeah. first show, it, it took place on March 3rd, 2001 in Grand Prairie. And then it looks like you had a couple of shows in 2001. Uh, looks like about three or four in 2002. What happened that first year of business? How did you get into into mixed martial arts? And, the first and year, first year was great. We started in two thousand, exactly. Two, we actually started in ninety nine, and then we like the mentality of it all, right? And then two thousand, we started the the the, the show, and, and 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 what happened was, I did it because I heard people talking about it, and mm -hmm. and I saw a Pancrase tape. Right for the first time, and I saw I saw Boss Root knock out Funaki with an open hand strike. He almost killed him, and I was like, "Oh my God, did you see that?" <laughs> and and Boss Root was the first fight I ever saw. And then I saw the fight with him and Frank Shamrock, where he smacked Shamrock in the face and knocked him through the ring. Right, wow. and 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 I was like, and the ironic part of all this. Now think about this: how ironic my life has been. I saw Shamrock and Funaki and Boss Rutan fight very first time. I am now really good friends with Boss Rutan. I'm good friends with Frank Shamrock. I went to train with Shamrock. I, 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 I had Boss here many times. You know, like, it's just ironic how I saw a tape started the MFC and then became friends with the people on the tape. It's just the that, craziest that's amazing. thing. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. And, crazy. And, and, and for those that, that don't know, you, you, you personally have a long history in, in martial arts and, and boxing and, and, and stuff like that. When did you start training? You know, it's funny too, man. That, that's something I never, ever like, like I, I must've done 9,000 interviews in my lifetime. And you I never I, talk I about it. Never, I never, ever, ever, no one ever asked about it either. It's, it's so ironic. It's like, you know, it's funny. I heard some guy one time in a gym say, Mark Pavlich showed me that, you know? Yeah. And, and someone said, you mean the promoter? <laughs> and he said, no, I mean the martial instructor. And, then you guys, and they go, is that the same person? And he goes, yeah, it's the same person. You well, know? it's funny because like we've trained with some of the same people. Like old school, you know, guys over at Panther Gym, and and you know, even back in the day when when I was, you know, when I you know I trained you know way way back in the day before MMA was even around. But I mean, your name was floating around back then. I mean, with guys like uh, back train, think back on that scene, it was guys like Trevor Hardy and Junior Olson and and uh, and Greg. Uh, I forgot Greg's name. I fought on a Greg show LaBeouf? with Greg, Greg LaBeouf. Greg LaBeouf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I fought with that guy on a show down in Idaho, and I remember him 
floating, you know, your name around is, is some of the few guys that were in Edmonton that were that were taking up some of that sport and you know making the rounds at the gym. Yeah, it's and funny, like man. That. And nobody ever. It's funny, man, because that that to me, I always thought I was the best at. Like you know, when I criticize myself, my like, people say, "Oh, you know, you're the best promoter ever for MMA in this country." You know, I'm like, I don't know, man. That wasn't that wasn't my thing. I was I wanted to get respect as a martial artist, right? And mm-hmm. people are like, what? What the hell? What do you care? You know, I'm like, ah, I just always wanted to get respect for it. You know, right. and it was like. It was like it was weird. It was like I used to almost get weird emotionally, even when like, when Jason McDonald would win in the UFC, you know. And he and at that time I was like, you know, I had big contracts for television. The MFC was huge, and he 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 was like sitting in the octagon going, "I'm thanking my trainer, you know, yeah, Mark Pavlich." And I was like, I used to get more thrill out of him thanking me for that than anything else, right? Because he acknowledged that I was the trainer, you know, I'm the reason why, you know, to get him to the place to win. And, and, and and that's something that I always took such great pride in, you know, Mm -hmm. I would, I would sacrifice my other businesses to get ready for a fight that we were getting ready for. It was crazy. That's, that's insane. And, and you were, you know, a guy that was behind a lot of the talent back then you were, you were behind it. You know, I mean, you were, you had a lot of guys come come through your promotion, but there was also a personal side to that as well. Of course, well. there was. I mean, at one time, one time in a gym, you know, I don't know. Like it's just, it's it's almost borderline sad to even talk about it because it's like at one time in a gym, I had I was the tr- only trainer. There was no other trainers around, mm-hmm. and it was me, Jason McDonald, Victor Valamaki, Ryan McGilvery, Ryan Ford. Um, there's more. I can't. I don't want to forget anybody. Yeah. But th- all those guys, I was training them all at the same time. You know, we were. Yeah, and it's funny it's too because a lot of guys. Yeah, awesome talent, right? And then, and then, and then it's funny because a lot of guys now that used to come and train with us. They came one or two times and they couldn't hang with these guys. And right. it's like now, now some of these guys are in the UFC. It's almost ironic, you know. <laughs> but but it was just kind of funny because we trained extremely hard. You know, the guys were very dedicated. You know, they knew that with, with what we were doing, there was no shortcuts for anything. You know, that's kind of how I, I train people. And, you know, it, it was funny because I used to read on the Internet and people say, oh, he don't know how to train anybody. And he don't know how to you know, I used right, to think right. it's I, And I used to take it so serious, man. It used to kill me when I used to read that stuff because I'm like, they don't know me, man. Why would they say that? You know, I work so hard and, 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 and I get no respect for it. And then my wife used to tell me, what do you care? I'm the first person to ever train a fighter from Alberta to go to UFC. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's true. A fact. Yeah, yeah, I remember there was a video floating around, and and uh, I don't remember what happened in that video. But I, I, and this was before I, I think I had met you or I had heard your name, and I remember looking up a video, and I think it was on YouTube at the time, mm-hmm. and it was you in the, it looked like a basement of a gym, and that was Panthers Gym. That was Panthers Gym. I remember the video. And yeah, and it it had Ryan Ford. I remember seeing uh, Valamaki, you know, McDonald, all these guys, and and they like the like the workout that you were putting them through. It, it had you there yelling and you know blowing the whistle and, and you know getting after these guys. And, and I just remember thinking, Jesus Christ, there, there there's a there's a basement somewhere where there's you know serial killers being trained right now. Like these guys looked absolutely insane, like just complete insane. warriors, man. Insane. They, yeah. they were like, set, like it was so crazy. They were they were super competitive with each other, mm-hmm. but not to the point where it was dangerous. Right. And 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 no one, no one knew not to like. It was like everybody was there for a reason. Everybody was there on a positive mentality. Right. Um. You know, I still have tape from the, that era, and I still, on a very rare occasion have the time and I actually love watching it. I do. I, I, I it, it, it makes me happy and sad all at the same time. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. And a lot of those fighters, you know, obviously, like you had said, had gone on to, to, you know, to fight in your promotion for, you know, a long, long time. Some of those fighters are retired now. When did, when did you know that the maximum fighting championship was going to be around for good? How did you know that that was the show that you were going to just put everything else to bed with and, and just focus on that, on that one business? People just couldn't stop talking crap about me, Jake. That's why. They so it was essentially stop. like yeah, yeah. again laying yeah, down a gauntlet for you. They just couldn't stop. Like everybody, everybody would talk crap about me. People talk crap about my family. People just talking crap. I'm like, that's a mistake. See, if they had any sense, but it's too late because most of these people have no sense. 
they should have said nothing. They should have praised me because I would have I would have been there like, oh yeah, they praised me. They're nice people, you know. It's like <laughs> they don't get it, man. They no, they want to throw rocks at me. So I'm like, okay, you know, if you're if people were listening earlier about how much I love shoving dirt in people's mouths that keep you know yapping off, and it's like you know I don't even have to say it no more. I, they know they know they're choking on it. Right. You went on to sign a monumental deal. Uh, live TV deal, and at the time it was HDNet. Now it's Access uh, TV, and uh, Mark Cuban, Ryan Seacrest, I believe, uh, are involved in, yep, in the right. network. And but your first relationship was really with Mark Cuban. I think Seacrest kind of came along a little bit after. That's right. And and a lot of people don't know that that you have a personal relationship with uh, with Mark. What? How did all that come about, and 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 how did this promotion in Edmonton of all places end up? being one of the longest running shows on on access oh like, we're the longest running show on access too that's for sure but what you know is i i really you know needed to be on television you know i i get i got like that right and i'm getting like that right now with msc but other stuff too but i i, I kind of got to get really mad and and then i start saying okay I, you know why am I not on television? But nobody at that time was on television, you know? <laughs> and I was like, no, I, I want to be on television. And, you know, and, and then it happened. And, and then, you know, I, I said, you know, I wanted Mark Cuban to come to Edmonton to, to make the deal, and he did. And we met, and we, we had days that we talked about, you know, how to make this thing better and so on and so on. But that's, um, you know, that's just kind of, it gets to a point where I'm – I find things boring, I find things stagnant, and I, I'm the one that's responsible for changing them. Mm -hmm. and, and when you got the TV deal done, did that open you up for, I mean, obviously a lot more access to fighters in the United States? And, and be, because there's there has been some critics about, you know, you use a lot of American fighters. Uh, and, you know, obviously I have a background in, in, in mixed martial art and the management side of things. Um, but I can also attest to uh, th there's a big pool of Canadian fighters, but they're not always willing to step up and fight all the time. I hear that lots. You know, people say, oh, you know, I'll fight anybody. It's not true. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's a, one of the biggest lies in MMA. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just people just won't fight anybody. That's not how it works. And people are very cautious and people want to protect their records and people want to, you know, and that's what happens. And I'm, I'm not criticizing those people for doing it either. I, that's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. But in MFC, you don't get to pick your fights. You don't get to, you don't get to pick who you're going to, you know, go down, you know, get in a scrap with. And, you know, that's, that's the reality. And a lot of guys don't want to deal with that type of reality. Why do you think controversy is, is a label that people have, have put on you before? I know that, that, you know, you're, you're also known as a very great promoter. Uh, you're one of the few promoters that that actually do a lot of uh, uh, you know press tours and stuff like that. You're constantly in Toronto on TV. Uh, you got lots of radio bits. A lot of fighters that that they want to become part of the Maximum Fighting Championship family because they do get a lot of exposure. And to you, what what drives that whole scenario? And 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 do you feel that that having that access? opens your company up to to a lot of better fighters and and people that that want to come out and and fight for you yeah that's the number one thing when we when we started doing tv deals with them i used to think it was so funny because when we signed the, the tv deal we were in business for like not even six months yet with mark cuban and people were like oh yeah they're gonna get rid of the maximum fighting championship and then the next year would come around and i just hear all these other guys chirping saying oh yeah they're gonna get rid of the maximum fighting championship <laughs> and then three years went by and they're like oh yeah they're done this year for sure for sure you know and it's like then we renewed and it's like it's just crazy you know it's like it's like people, people, you know, it's funny in Canadian MMA, it's like people don't want you to be overly successful, they don't want you to be overly grandiose, they don't want you to be overly happy, and it's weird, you know, and it's like, that's always been a kind of a, a sour note with me, you know, it's like, you know, we our, our biggest contributor is Access TV and Mark Cuban for financially, and, and you know, you, you would think being the only show on TV. When I signed with TSN, too, the funniest thing was, you think that these huge companies were going to come along and sponsor the MFC and stuff? We have big companies, but I'm saying is, it's like, you know, you would think that bigger name companies would get involved, and they didn't, you know? And it's like, that's always kind of been a, a sore spot for me, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, but that's, that's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. It's interesting, too, because uh, 
I, I know just in having conversations with you, uh, you, you know, private uh, conversations, you've always had a good ability of seeing things become successful before they actually did. You mm -hmm. you were on the record to say that I think you know that Kimbo Slice was was not just a you know uh, a guy that uh, that uh, uh, you know you would put on a show and not have any you know type of uh, attention with same with guys like Brock Brock Lesnar with the UFC and stuff That's like true, that. Yep. And, yep. and and I, I remember having these conversations. I remember this was I mean anybody who does just a regular Google search and, and looks at interviews with you from from the past. I mean you've been on the record to say. I, I think it'd be foolish not to have these guys on on Correct. television. Why do you think that it takes other promoters a long time to figure out their mistakes? And unfortunately, a lot of times that those promoters will end up, you know, belly up before those they realize those types of things. But why do you think you have such an intrinsic gift and ability to to, to kind of foresee success before it actually happens? That's the only thing I have that ability in, though. That's so. In one aspect, I'm extremely fortunate, but in another aspect, it's it's sad because. I don't have that ability in other things in life, right? Where I can see in this sport, you know, those type of trends and those type of things. But we're all looking for different things, you know. A lot of people that promote shows, they're more fans of just the fighter. They're not fans of what they're doing. I respect the fighters. I love them. I got no, that's not the issue. But a lot of these promoters, they, they, they you know, you know, it's funny. I always hear this term. Oh, the, we do it for the fighters. We do it for the fighters. Listen, man, if you do it just for the fighters, you're going to go broke, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and every fighter out there needs to understand that, first and foremost. If there's not guys like me, you don't fight, right? right? So the first and foremost thing is the mathematics behind the maximum fighting championship. That's the number one priority. Not me, personally, not my family, none of that. The, 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 fi the, fi the, the, the financial... Um, stability is the most important thing and that's what people not the fighters not the fans nothing not, nothing right. matters that is the most important thing because if there is no money if there is no sponsorship if there is no tv deal there is no maximum fighting championship and there is nobody fighting for it and there's no stage to perform the, on the, for correct yeah Correct. I've always had a great deal of respect for fighters. Why? Because I'm the guy that used to train fighters at the highest level, right? I'm the guy that used to set up the ring in the cage. I'm the guy that did all that stuff. So I'm not talking like some guy that doesn't have experience in those fields. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I started I started out as the guy washing dishes, man. So right. don't don't anybody ever tell me I'm some, you know, Johnny come lately or jumping on some bandwagon of MMA. That's that's absolute bullshit. Right. You know what I mean? So I I feel very comfortable saying that, you know, when I've been in conversations with people going, you know, it's all about the fighters. I'm like, yeah, good luck with that. You know, see how far that takes you. Right. And, you, I mean, obviously we've seen a lot of promotions come and go in Edmonton. We've seen a lot of promotions that come in with a lot of flair and, and a lot of fuss. In the and, world, and I've seen it. I've absolutely. seen it in the world. Yeah. I've seen I see it now even with other shows that are current right now that, you know, not paying fighters, you know, three, four months late on paying fighters, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all kinds of like, oh, this guy's going to be on the show, and you know he's not going to be on the show. And they do lots of that kind of stuff. It's just, it's deceiving the public. It's, it's, it's shifty. It's, not, it's nothing that our sport needs. And, you know, I, I'm going to be a big advocator of, of exposing those type of people doing that kind of stuff because it hurts all of us. With your success in the business, without giving away every trick of the trade or, or every trade secret that, that you've learned along the way, what do you think your secrets to success have been in, in, in the mix? Like what's the, what's the key to, to, to your longevity? Because I think, uh, in, in our personal dealings, I mean, you know, we, you and I, we, we've had, we've had great talks, we've had arguments, we've had, you know, I mean, it's gone the entire gamut. But the one thing I got to say is that the, the times that I've heard people say negative things about you, it always boils back down to, when when you look into the details of it, it is usually you holding someone accountable for staying true to their contract. Correct. So that's a big that's a big thing that's a big thing in our industry, right? Because you got fighters out there that sign contracts and then decide that they don't want to fight, and then we live in a country that's super symp sympathetic to to not holding to contracts. And I mean, in the states, it's totally different, but our country is extremely sympathetic when it comes to corporate law and. And, and, you know, you, you people think, oh, signing a contract is the end-all of end-all. Not in, not in Canada, it's not. I think more in the States, they, it's more of a, 
you know, a lock thing. Mm -hmm. But here I've had fighters that, you know, were under contract with us for no apparent reason, felt the need that, you know, because someone, some, some pirate came along and said, here, we're going to pay you, you know, three bean stocks you know, <laughs> more. Right. So come fight for us. And then jump, they do it in the next the show. They're out of, yeah. bu- they're out of business. Right. 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 And, and, and mixed martial arts has not been obviously your only business as time has gone on. Uh, you run a very successful uh, consulting business on the side. Can you tell me a bit about about that business? I was sitting around one day, and my, my dear friend, Ken Franchak, uh, who, who's the general manager for the Crystal Glass organization, who's also a sponsor of the Maximum Fighting Championship, mm-hmm. we're having dinner at another sponsor's restaurant, Character's Restaurant, and uh, we're in a private room there, and he says to me one day, you know, Mark, you should start a marketing company. He goes, your, 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 your social media skills are insanity, you know. And I said, oh, thanks, you know, but I have no choice to, but to be insane on social media because that's the only way I could compete, you know. Right. And so I said, oh, thank you, I really appreciate it. No, he says, you know, you should really do it for real, Mark, you know. And I said, uh, yeah, you know, I don't really have time, you know, for another business, but... You know, so we're driving home in O and I, and I said, she said, you know, Mark, you really are good at this stuff, right? So I said, she said, you're you're more creative than you thought you were, you know. And I said, yeah, maybe, you know. And I said, yeah, but it's for the Maximum Fighting Championship, so I I, I love it, so I, it's easy for me to do. And she goes, why don't you do it for other companies? And I'm not kidding you. This we were having dinner on a Friday. On the Monday, he calls me into their office at Crystal Glass and says we want to hire your company. I didn't even have business cards made up. I didn't have nothing. <laughs> he, he had me do a spiel in the boardroom. He said, this is it. This is our guy, blah, blah, blah. And they signed me immediately. And, and then, uh, then I had to scramble and get the business started. And then ever since then, we've acquired, you know, huge accounts with people. We've been involved in po- political, um, you know, campaigns where we were quite successful. We, you know, we're with Integra Tire, which is a gigantic tire company in Canada. And we're with, you know, that's, we're with Trend Homes and home companies. And it's crazy. It's like, you know, we're working on deals with real estate people. We're working on deals with dentist people. We're, I mean, it's, it's just absolute craziness what happened with this marketing company. And I'm really enjoying it. Like, I, it's, it's a great break from being in the MMA business for 14 years and solely be concentrating on that for 14 years. Right. It, it's helped both businesses out immensely that I get a break mentally from the MMA business on occasion with the Mark Consulting. I was going to say, it probably is a, is, is, is a good feeling of exercising your brain in other ways. Yeah, than just doing it's, a the... big, it's a big difference, right? Because when you're, 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 you're obsessively always thinking about the Maximum Fighting Championship and for such a long period of time, it's detrimental too. Mm-hmm. And in, this marketing company has almost revived me in the mixed martial art business. Your wife has been involved in the business with you for a, a long period of time. Your son Dave has been uh, involved in the Maximum Fighting Championship. He even had his own promotion for for uh, quite a while, very successful promotion. Um, your daughter was involved in the promotion. Uh, you know, everything from you know flyering and and singing the national anthem. It, it truly is is one of the few family businesses that that really mean family business that I've seen people in in your family work all aspects of the job from booking travel to medicals to picking up people at the airport. How do you manage to keep those relationships going in in such a positive way and uh, anybody that's that's a friend with you on Facebook, I mean, it looks like you and your wife just met a week ago and you guys just started dating. Like, you guys are doing pictures at restaurants over dinner and, and it looks like you guys have I'm date so nights. I'm so Like, I, 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 because, you know what's funny, man? I never took pictures before. Mm-hmm. All the places I've been in the MMA world, I don't have a picture with nobody. Right. I'm not kidding you. Nobody. Right. You know, and, 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 and it was funny because at one point I went to a funeral, right? And I went to a funeral and, the, and this guy had the slideshow on. And I was so jealous, and he was dead, and I was jealous, okay? <laughs> and I was like, I, and I'm not a jealous person, and I was jealous because this guy had the best slideshow in the history of slideshows for a funeral. I was so jealous that he captured all those moments of time, and I never did that, right? Mm-hmm. So after that day was over, I started doing it obsessively. Right. Because I said when I meet him in heaven that I will have a better slideshow at my funeral than anybody will ever have. Mm-hmm. So, and you know what's funny too? Uh, most of my pictures are never with people that are famous. They're people that are my friends. 
right? Right, right? And that's to me is my joy. I've I've been standing next to extremely famous people that want to take pictures with me, and I'm running over to my daughter saying, "Kayla, take a picture with your dad," you know, <laughs> and they, they think it's funny. But I'm I'm such a fan of my son, my daughter, my wife, my friends. I I really am. I'm a like I'm a fan of them. And they think it's so weird, you know, because they, they think what I do is so spectacular. But I just, I do, I, I'm, uh, I'm such a fan, and I, 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 I run to take pictures with my family. Run. That's amazing that, 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 you know, like I said, you're one of the very few people that have such a strong family core that people in your family obviously are so involved in the business and, and they all support each other. And, and it's like, it's just like one big fighting team that, that everybody pulls their own weight. Um, I realized that though recently though, because that's so true, but we have to start taking time off because right. we, we're not notorious for taking time off. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we're going to start doing now on a little more of a, I don't want to say a regular occasion, but I have to, I have to personally be the responsible for making these decisions because mm -hmm. I won't stop. Right. So I have to make, and that means if I don't stop, they don't stop. Right. But I have to make sure that we do stop from here on in, that we're going to have to make conscious efforts like, you know, go to Vegas. Mano and I are going to Paris this summer, you know, things like that. We have to do that. That's mandatory. Now, and I know you got a flight to catch, so I'm going to wrap this up with you. But what are the next steps for you? I know that that you know you've got a you know like you like you said a very successful consulting business on the side. Uh, the mixed martial arts promotion is is going strong. Um, are you going to keep on the same schedule of of you know a MMA event you know every every couple of months um, and and just keep on going I need like something that? Something exciting, Jake. I need something exciting now. This is that stage again where I get to and I'm like, oh my god, man. Okay, we're not going to talk about it. We're going to keep talking about going to the states, going to the states, going to the states. It's mm -hmm. like, well, why why don't people understand, man? Why why we have to go to the states? Mm -hmm. We have to go to the United States of America. I want to do shows in Las Vegas. You know, there was a time when Live Nation contacted us. They wanted to do business with us. And, and I really thought that that was going to be our, our kind of, like, launch into the United States. And, mm -hmm. You know, we couldn't make a deal with Live Nation, but I really, want, I really thought to myself, like, how that could have been uh, such a big thing, being with Live Nation going into the States. You know, we're, we've been in talks with the joint at the Hard Rock. Right. You know, and I want to I facilitate those deals because – that's the things that are going to get my brain working again the right in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How can people reach you, follow you on Twitter? You've got a huge Twitter following. You, you, you're very active on Facebook, the Maximum Fighting Championship uh, fan book page. What's the easiest way for people to follow you? I think it's funny, man. My my Twitter is the the the, the Dom Perignon of Twitter, <laughs> and I I say that to everybody because I have the craziest like following of people oh man in, i can in, read in your threads for, for 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 days dude i can but all the, uh, in the twitter world i know there's no question people that follow me are the most eclectic human beings in the world mm -hmm. i have everything from um religious people to mma people to prostitutes to porn stars to <laughs> the gamut it's the, to the gamut is insanity man it's like crazy i i see the people following me and i'm like oh my god it's crazy you know and i have famous people following me and it's like and i don't i follow very few famous people i follow more my friends and you right. know people like that it's weird it's like i i'm i'm more interested in what they're doing but it's so funny you see my 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 twitter page is like you know my pastor's there and then oh there's a porn star following <laughs> me and then all of a sudden there's it's crazy you know and i'm like wow why are porn i don't watch porn why are they following me you know but it's just, it's so funny that it's like so weird of a mix mixed martial art people people from my church you oh know? yeah yeah it's such an eclectic mix of people man it, it's, oh, it's uh nuts, it's great man. It, it's not and then now that we're in the marketing business so people follow us for that but it's just like it's it's, it's not it's not just mma it's still a majority i think is mma people but it, that percentage has gone down a lot right right how can people find you what's your handle on uh, twitter I, I, you know just at mark pavlage you know that's that's our we're on twitter and then um you know on 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 facebook on our maximum fighting championship facebook page and 
you know, our website is MaximumFighting.com, and we're on Instagram, <laughs> on everything. <laughs> You're man. on everything, you man. Know, yeah, just go to Google, man, and just put it in, and, it's, you know, we're, it's, it's, it's insanity, man. It's just going to keep growing, too, you know, and there's no stopping what we're doing. Mrs. P's on Twitter, too. She's a... Uh, She's on there. She's the I say she's the queen of the retweet. You I know? think she's, I follow her. I think I follow yeah. her now. Yeah, she's, she's the queen, <laughs> the of, the retweet, queen of the retweet. You know, so if you put something intelligent out there, she's gonna probably retweet it. <laughs> it's she's crazy. Awesome, man. Man. She, she and she's a Virgo, so she retweets everything the Virgo people say. And then, oh yeah, yeah, she, yeah. But she's uh, it's funny sometimes. We'll we'll be sit, we'll be sitting in the car, and me and Dave will be like she'll walk into somewhere. And all of a sudden, our phones are going ding 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 for about an hour. And we're like, what the hell is going on? That's her retweeting all our stuff. And we're like, what? <laughs> so she's the queen of the retweets. Oh man, that's brilliant. Well, hey, thank you yeah. for you know, and, and, and again. It, I love this interview because it was it was literally 15% MMA and it was truly 85% about getting to know who you are as, uh, as a person and that and that's the person that I wanted people to get to know and and to and to kind of find out about and 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 understand why there's a friendship there and there's been one for a very long time so I'm honored that you came on the show Mark and and thank you for taking us on this journey with you and and explaining where you came from and what inspires you and what uh, what uh, drives you uh, I I appreciate you having me on man it's like you know, and I'm glad we did this one late night because uh, that's when we do our best work, you know. So, Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Yeah, I love, uh, you know, we, you stay up late, I stay up late, and, you know, whatever the other, you know, minions are doing in the MMA world, they're probably all sleeping. <laughs> exactly, man. That's when the best work happens at <laughs> night, man. That's right. Thanks for coming on the show, Mark. Enjoy your I trip. I appreciate it. You, uh, thanks a lot, Jake. You take care now. All right, brother. Talk to you soon. All right, bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. bye-bye. I don't